<laughs> All right, so we, as, as, as Pastor Troy said, we've done a week of our 28 days of prayer. I told you last week that we do, we do prayer in the beginning of our year every year because... Um, you know, we can do a lot of great things, and we do a lot of great things here. I mean, like even this ministry to moms who have, uh, you know, young ones, you know, moms of preschoolers, kids birth through pre-K, um, you know, great ministry could be a great time, but if the Lord's not in all of what we do, then we do it for naught. You know, we don't do it. We don't do anything here for entertainment purposes only. Or even just because it's a worthy thing. We do it to honor Christ, to exalt Christ in everything we do, and to point others to him. That's why we do it. And so we pray, and we really concentrate in this time because of that. So last week, our theme was pause. Selah in Scripture. Selah, to, to stop and to reflect on it. And we live in pretty busy lives, and we talked about that last week, where it's pretty easy to kind of say, I'll get to God later, and later becomes really later. And uh, we need that pause. We need that stop where we go before God. So um, I'll put that, put that slide back up. Our overall, overall is pursuing God. So if you're going to pursue God, we say the first thing is you've got to stop. You got to pause. You got to go to Him. And then the, the second week theme that we have this week is surrender. Oh, surrender. That's a, that is a tough word. That's a hard word, isn't it? Uh, to surrender means you got to give up something. It means you got to give up something. I like what Webster says. Webster says this this is the dictionary, uh, the dictionary definition of surrender to yield to the power, control, or possession of another. Upon compulsion or demand. And I think that's a good definition, a good biblical definition for surrender um, in our lives. That we need to give up control, right? So it says, where is it again? To, to yield power, control, or possession to another. And of course, our other is Jesus, to God. To surrender what it is. And um, I initially... Uh, gave Janice a title, and so in your bulletin, there's a title that says Total Surrender or Full Sur I don't even know what it says anymore, and uh, I was like, no, I, I just hit me Friday, and then I forgot to tell her I changed the title, um, but our title is Unconditional Surrender. Now, that's important. Uh, when uh, the U.S. Uh, went to Japan and defeated Japan, Japan unconditionally surrendered to the United States, which means they got to make no demands. They got to choose how nothing happened. They were under the tutelage of the United States. Now, for them, it ended up being a very good thing. Be, you know, one of the you know, tremendously peaceful nation with tremendous uh, technology. They started putting stuff into that. But uh, if it wasn't a benevolent, a good overlord, if we can call it that way, it wouldn't have been good, right? But unconditional surrender. Uh, and, and we say, well, really, that, ooh, I don't mind surrender, but like unconditional, which means I get no say. Sounds like a lot, but yet that is what God has demanded Forever. We, we just got through a series in our summer of Abraham, and, and if you look at Israel after Abraham, God always required Abraham, to, uh, Abraham and Abraham's lineage to serve him, and he would not tolerate anything else, anything else, including when they didn't, they sent, he sent instruments of other nations in to discipline them, to bring them back. And so the same is true today. And, and here's the deal. Most Christians, I think, understand that there's some level of surrender that needs to happen to God. We get that. The problem is, like I said, we want to negotiate terms. We want to say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do as long as, or as, lo you know, as long as it's in my comfort zone, as long as I don't feel out of place, as long as you're not asking me to do something that stretches me too far. Stretching a little, okay, that's all right, God. Right, but like, whoa, wait a second. That's not who I am, or that's not what I feel like I am, or whatever. And so, like I said, we don't, we don't mind surrendering as long as uh, we can keep what we want, do what we want, have what we want, go where we want, not go where we don't want. 
wherever we are. Um, well, I'm here to tell you, God has required of us total surrender, unconditional surrender, like everything. He wants it all. He wants, he wants everything. He wants to be able to dictate everything. He wants us to follow him wherever he goes, wherever he sends us, without question, even if it doesn't look good, even if it's not enough, even if we don't have enough in our tank for that. I, I think of Israel when it was sent into the promised land. They were only supposed to be out of Egypt two years. That's all they were supposed to be out of Egypt for. And God sends them up to the Negev, the, the south, and he, you know, he says, go, you're going you're gonna to take the land. And they said, well, can we send some spies? And so they send 12 spies, one representative from everyone. And they're like, certainly the land flows with milk and honey. It's exactly what God said, except that there are big people there with big cities and big walls and well-fortified and strong men. As a matter of fact, they, they got themselves into a frenzy. So they said at the end, the conclusion was we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes. Now, that was an interesting statement because it was in their own eyes. See, they were viewing the people of the land in comparison to themselves instead of viewing the people of the land in comparison to God. And they said, we can't do it. And I'm, I'm sure God, although I don't think it's in the verse, Numbers 13 and 14 in this, but God would have said, you're right. You don't have enough. You couldn't beat them on your own if I don't go with you. But I'm going with you. So they rebelled against God. As a matter of fact, we know that's the case because they rebelled against God. They realized that they should have done what God said they did. So then they go, well, we're going to go up and, and do it now. And God already judged them to 40 years in the desert and said, nope, that's not what's going to happen. Every one of this generation is going to die in the desert. And uh, they try to go up, and they get defeated soundly. Crazy. Crazy. Um crazy. Uh, I'm going to make a statement here that is absolutely true. Um, every single person here talks to themselves. Matter of fact, if you just said, I don't talk to myself, <laughs> you just proved my point. Right? We all talk to ourselves and we all think that we have this kind of understanding and that we really know best. Like, I know what's best for me. See, we've been, we've been conditioned in this world to say, you really know what's best for you. And I'm here to tell you, you don't. But God does. God does. And so, um, that's what he calls us to. And so, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles as we talk about this unconditional surrender to the book of Matthew. Chapter 16, and again, these are hard words. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be honest, this is going to be a hard sermon. Um, maybe the hardest in, in all of, well, it will be the hardest in our 28 days of prayer. Um, this is a hard sermon. It's interesting. If we look at the context, Matthew chapter 16, right before the passage that we're about to uh, talk about. Jesus is with his disciples at an earlier time, a little bit earlier than this, and, and he's asking them, what do people say about me? In other words, what are you guys hearing? And there's all kinds of things, you know, like you're Elijah, come back, and, and you're, you're John the Baptist, even come back, and you're, you're, you're a prophet, and you're this, and you're that. Um, and then Jesus asks them a very pointed question. He says, who do you say that I who do you, who do you say that I am? I'm going to tell you, in, in, in all of everything, in all of the world, the only thing that matters is what do you think about Jesus? What do you say about him? And this is where Peter, uh, you know, steps up and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus praises him, and he says, you know, you, Simon Barjona, you know, blessed are you because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. In other words, he said that with confidence, with all belief and all faith. There wasn't a doubt. It wasn't like we think that you might be the Messiah. We think you might be the Christ. No, no, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. There's no doubt in our mind. 
And so he says, listen, on that, we will build my church. I, I will build my church on that. And so Simon gets praised, and there's this, really this, this awesome kind of scene of Simon being um, praised for, for what he says, um, that upon that confession, uh, the church will be built, and, and there's kind of a goodness about that. But then we get to Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. Now, it's not in the same context, all right? It's not at the same exact time that this happens in that. So if you look at Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, you see what he says. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and then raised again on the third day. So um, this is after this, and Jesus begins kind of this time because, um, you know, in the, in the book of John especially, it, it, there's this, you know, they tried to arrest Jesus, but it wasn't his time, it wasn't his time, it wasn't his time. And then there's this transition in the book of John, chapter 13, where it says, and, and, and then it was his time. In other words, it was in God's plan. God knew what he was doing exactly at the time that he knew he was going to do it. And this is the time, and Jesus begins to tell his disciples that this is what's going to happen. We're going to go to Jerusalem, we're going to suffer many things, I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to be raised again. Now, for um, a people who were anticipating the Christ to come and to take over the government, to set up the throne of David once again, and to rule as they once did during the time of David as the leading nation in the world probably, they said, wait, uh, that, that can't be. And, and Simon, now it doesn't say it here, but... Simon speaking to himself this whole time. Now, mind you, I think all the disciples are. Simon just, you know, has the gumption to say something. And so look at what happens, verse 22. It says, Peter took him aside, Jesus aside, and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, he's like, this is Patrick's in, uh, translation. I get it, okay? He's like, dude, you, you cut it out. Like, you're bumming everybody out. Like, you're, you're, you're in the spiral. Like, we know you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. I've said it. You were like, yep, that's who I am. Blessed are you because you know it. And, and, and like, so why are we going down this road? Like, we're going to win, buddy. You got it. You got it, God. You, you know, like, he needs to encourage Jesus somehow on what God's plan is. Whatever. But see, that's where we get. We begin to think that we know God's plan, even when the Son of God is saying, this is God's plan. You know, I know what, I know what God's plan is for my life because God would never ask me to do this. God would never ask me to go there. God would never ask me to, to talk to this person or to teach this thing or to lead this thing or, or to commit to this place. God would never ask me to do that. That's outside of my purview. Or he wouldn't ask me to go to that country. He wouldn't ask me to go to that place. It's unsafe. It's not what God would ask me to do. Really? Like, you know better than God. And so... Jesus' response to Peter is almost shocking. Verse 27. But he turned to him, he turned and said to Peter, sorry, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. That's big. I need you to stay in that. I wish there was a Selah here. Pause and reflect. Get behind me, Satan. Now, this is Peter, the chief apostle, the chief apostle, the man who has risked his neck literally for Jesus time and time again, and by the way, would continue to risk his neck for Jesus time and time again to the point that he was killed for Jesus eventually in his life. He was a man who was faithful and a man who was all in, like Peter was all in. Um, a little bit out there sometimes, right? He would put himself out there without thinking a little bit. But he had already thought it. He kind of knew, he, you know, we, we kind of think we know what we, where we're going. We kind of think we got it all together. 
And, and sometimes we'll rebuke people in that, thinking that, oh, wait, wait, I know what's really happening here because we think we know best. And God says, that's not the way it is. As a matter of fact, he, again, he calls Peter Satan, not because Peter is Satan, okay? Not because Peter was given over to Satan forever after that or anything like that. Peter didn't lose his salvation. Peter didn't walk in Satan or anything like that. But I really believe what Jesus is saying is this, is that when you stand against the purposes of God, no matter who you are, you could be the most faithful man or woman of God. When you stand against the purposes and the plans of God, you are an instrument of Satan. So think about that again. Selah, in the church of Jesus Christ, pastors and leaders and faithful men and women of God can actually be tools of Satan to, to cause the church to not do what God has called it to do, to be a discouragement in the church of Jesus Christ toward the purpose of what God, oh my goodness gracious, if you've been in a church long enough, you know this already. You know this. Right? Peter did not have a better plan. He did not know what was going on. He was not the one in control. And then what Jesus does after that is paramount to, Peter, I need unconditional surrender from you. Unconditional surrender from you. Give it up, buddy. Give up your plans, give up your dreams, give it all up. That's what I need. So what does it look like for a believer to unconditionally surrender to Jesus? Well, that's what he talks about in these next verses. Verse 24, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what it looks like to unconditionally, because within one line, I believe he lays out, Four things that need to be true of us if we're going to completely submit, completely surrender, absolutely and totally unto the Lord Jesus Christ. The first is this, desire. Look at what he says. This is verse 24. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me. Now, let's stop right there. If anyone wishes to come after me, if there is a desire to come after me, New King James says. If there's a desire to, to come after Jesus, then stop, right? So that, that's where it's got to be first. It's, it's amazing to me that God doesn't make robots. We talked about this last week a little bit, that we have free will, that we can choose to follow or not, right? As a believer in Jesus Christ who, who loves Jesus with all my heart, I can still choose not to obey him. Matter of fact, we're frustrated in the church, aren't we? We're frustrated at churches at times, and especially at leaders, and I get why, because we stand up here opening the word of God every week, and we expect a higher standard, and you should. Please, listen, I have no problem with that. Now, that doesn't mean that I act like you think I should act all the time. I still like the Yankees, praise the Lord. Can I get a name, man? Never mind. All right. <clears throat> um, Right? I'm still, we still have different personalities. We still have things we like or don't like or whatever things. But should you expect me to be obedient to God? Why wouldn't you? Should I be faithful to my wife and faithful to my family? Absolutely. Well, I'm just human, and so I can't help it. I do sin. Now, listen, I've never, I've been here almost 15 years, and one month will be my 15-year anniversary at Grace Gospel Church. I, I, I've been here a long time, and, and there hasn't been any part of that time that I have said, no, no, I got it all together, people. Like, I'm all there. Like, just look at me and follow me because I'm perfectly walking in Christ. I'm not. I'm not. Now, praise God, as I'm maturing in Jesus Christ even still, the repentance hopefully comes quicker when I do something, when I think something, you know, when I think something about somebody, when I'm driving down the road, we're going to go upstate right after, right after this for a party and uh, at Daniel's family's house. And um, if I'm driving, whew, sometimes it's tough. It's tough. People do not know how to drive in Long Island. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. I speak truth. I only speak truth here, right? I mean, it's t right. So, 
we can begin to defame them. And I've told you stories of me driving down the road and, you know, singing praise songs to God with all of my heart. And somebody does something that I don't think that they should. Probably right after I did something that I shouldn't have done. Whatever. But, you know, I'm going to judge them. I'm going to be like, oh, how could you? It, you know, moron is my big word. Forgive me, Jesus. You're a moron. Um, and thank God that he immediately, almost always. Now, I wish, I wish he didn't have to because I wish I wouldn't even go there. I just wish I wouldn't. But thank God, thank you, Jesus, truly, for the Holy Spirit in my life that just convicts me immediately to be like, uh-huh, like you're good. Right? right? We're, we're, so, so we're not perfect. I get it, but, but you, there should be a standard there. There should be a standard that we follow Jesus, that we give it all, that, that I desire my Savior. If you have a pastor that doesn't desire to know Jesus better, get rid of the pastor. Now, like if there's a season, be careful, come and encourage and all that kind of stuff. But like, I mean, you know, we got to be pursuing God. we got to be hungry for that. Matter of fact, next week we'll talk about that. So he says, if there is a desire, we have a choice to go there. As a matter of fact, that word desire means longing or yearning or hunger for. Like I said, we're going to talk about that next week. That's our theme for next week, hungering after God. Um, Because if we're going to pursue God, right, we got to do that. But it starts with surrender first. And so he says, if you desire to serve me, it doesn't, doesn't start with just jumping off and going. It starts with giving yourself over to him. All right, desire first. All right, now it's, ooh, it, it, it kind of gets deeper and harder. Second is denial. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. He must deny himself. Now, we're not talking about fasting here. All right, fasting is a great Uh, practice and discipline before God as you seek out God's face and as you desire to dive into him. My prayer is is that some of us during this 28 days of prayer would spend some time in fasting before God where we are desiring and pursuing him only and we're we're realizing that, that I don't need food more than I need Jesus. I need Jesus, right? So, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about denying yourself. As a matter of fact, 25 and 26 kind of explain that a little bit, right? And we'll get back to the rest of 24, I get it. But 25 says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? Or, in other words, it doesn't say that, but or, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? To deny myself, to deny me. And again, I, I, I believe most Christians at some level, I hope at a good level, understand that following Jesus means sacrifice. It means that it's not about me and I don't have to kind of feed what I want all the time. I can give up things so that I can serve others, whether it's time or money or, you know, I can use my time, talent, and treasures for the Lord and for uh, doing him. And I'm going to tell you, self is the enemy of being a true, complete follower of Jesus Christ. Self is an enemy of authentic discipleship. It's an enemy. Christ needs to be in the driver's seat. I don't need Christ driving next to me. I need Christ leading the way. Now, don't try that in your car. I get it, all right? We got all kinds of smart cars out there today. Drive themselves. I don't trust any of them. Please don't take your hands off the wheel. Um, But, but... God, you, you lead me where you want to go, right? I mean, so often we're like that old country song, whatever that was, right? Jesus, take the wheel, right? You know, when I've screwed it up really bad and I'm going too fast around the curve so that I start spinning out of control, then I want you to take it, Jesus. And sometimes I think Jesus now... Stay with me for a second. Sometimes I think Jesus says, what do you want me to do with this mess? Like, it's just going like this, and you expect me to correct it? Listen, I'll be with you at the crash, and I'll lead you back to the place that you need to go, but, like, you've thrown yourself off course. Too often, that's when we want Jesus to show up. I want Jesus to show up to stop me having the consequences of my mess that I caused. 
you know what, I need to give that up way before I'm going like this. Now, if you're going like this, it's not a bad place. There was another old country song back in the day. I only listened to country for a little bit of my life. There was this like little section. And, uh, but it, it was a song, I forget, what it, I forget what the even title was. It's just coming to me now. But they were like, you know, there's nothing wrong with rock bottom because rock bottom at least gives you good footing. And all you can do is go up, right? So unfortunately for a lot of us, even in our testimonies, you know, some of us, I should say, we had to hit rock bottom before we'd acknowledge and see that I have a great need for Jesus, that I'm a sinner and I can't do it on my own, that I had to give up on myself, right? So, so um, I, I need to get out of that way, right? It means that the voice talking in your head is not the loudest voice or not the voice that you listen to, even if it's the loudest voice. Matter of fact, I think sometimes God goes, I'll wait till you stop talking. And the problem is we just don't stop talking. And then we go, God, I thought you'd lead me. And he's like, I'm here. I'm waiting to talk to you, but you're not listening at all. Denial. Denial. To put aside ourselves because God is king and I am not. All right, it gets even worse (laughs) or deeper or harder. So uh, what is pursual and what is... um, unconditional surrender look like? It looks like a desire to pursue God, yes. It looks like denial of myself, but then Jesus says it needs to include death. Death. Look at what he says. Again, Matthew chapter 16, he says, verse 24, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny his cross, deny himself, sorry, and take up his cross. And take up his cross. Now, we've, we've talked a, a lot about this in my 15 years here about what that means. And it doesn't mean that, you know, like I have my back hurts and that's my cross to bear or something like that. As a matter of fact, for us, I mean, and we have a different looking cross in our church, right? It's not a shiny cross. It's not a nice wooden cross. It's a tree. And, and I asked for that a long time ago. And, and, and Fred built me a tree and it was for a specific thing, and we liked it so much, we were like, we're going to keep it. And then we had it up here, and then we finally hung it up on the wall. Um, so it's not your regular cross. It's sort of an old, rugged cross, but still did not even like what maybe what Jesus had. Um, but it's more, because for us, you know, crosses are decorations, right? We wear them around our, our necks, or we have earrings, or we have bracelets, or we have piercings, I don't even know. We have tattoos of the cross. But for Jesus and his disciples, the cross was not a piece of jewelry. It was an instrument of death. And it was an instrument of horrific death. I like what Billy Graham once said, and I've told you this before. You know, he once said, it was kind of like saying to his disciples, like it would be now, take up your electric chair and follow me. And, and you'd go, are you nuts? Like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, let's wear electric chairs around our neck. Because that would better represent in our own minds sometimes what Jesus really meant there. The cross was a place of death, and he is saying that we need to die on that place. Now, not only die in the fact of that when we, when we give our lives to Jesus, we die with him, but every day we need to take up our cross. Every day we need to die to self. We need to die to our desire, our burdens, our wishes, our hopes. That doesn't mean your hopes and your wishes are bad, but... But I like what Andy Stanley said in his book, Visioneering. He said, at the cross, I lost the right to determine what my future should look like. I gave up that right because I'm his. Because because I am his and he has called me to himself. To die to plans, everything. God, I'll, I'll, there was a time in my life as a pastor, I'd say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. He took me to Minnesota. Not Minneapolis. 
It would be like, oh, Minneapolis is a nice place. It is. He took me to northwest Minnesota. I was near Fargo. Do you know how cold it is in Fargo, North Dakota? I mean, I was right on the border. Like, I remember when we went there, um, October 31st, I don't know if we were there to, I forget, it was snowing October 31st. It froze somewhere in November to early December, and it stayed frozen until April. Like, farmers out there wanted to get in the field April 15th. Sometimes they could. A lot of times they could. Sometimes they couldn't. It was cold. It was cold in a lot of ways, not just in the atmosphere. It was a place that was outside of my comfort zone, outside of my people. I mean, I'm a northeasterner. I'm obnoxious at times. You know me. You've put up with me. You've tolerated me. Thank you. Thank you for that. I mean, I... But the truth is, I'm just one of you. <laughs> right? We fit together. I like this. I, I wasn't born on Long Island, never lived on Long Island. As a matter of fact, at one point in my life, swore I'd never go back to Long Island. By the way, do you realize that? You realize part of my testimony is, in, in the beginning of, the, of, of, of our marriage, Danielle had family on Long Island. We were coming here for a wedding, and, um, and we were driving, and we got lost. And so instead of going East on the Long Island Expressway, we went west on the Long Island Expressway and didn't know where we were looking for the sign until I saw the Manhattan, uh, so the, 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 um, the tunnel into Manhattan, and I said, what's that? And she went, uh, well, that's the tunnel in Manhattan, and in a few blocks, my aunt lives right over there. And in complete anger, I said, we are going through that, I'm turning around, we're driving to this wedding, and I'm never driving on Long Island again. And I didn't until 2009. I did not until I drove on the island as the lead pastor at Grace Gospel Church. Yeah, welcome back. Um, and you know what? That which I never wanted to do it turned out to be the best thing I have done in my ministry and in my life. Praise God. Praise God. I mean, you know, you, you, you've heard that. You, you tell God what you want to do, and he does what? He laughs. <laughs> okay, yeah, right. We'll get to, but I'm going to tell you, God will let you go do it. God will let you go do it. You need to die to yourself. You know what Galatians 2.20 says? Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. Well, yeah, I thought that meant salvation, that I join into his crucifixion so that then I can join into everything else he has. It does mean that. But it also means every day I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. We need to give it all up. We need to die to what we desire and what we want. Romans chapter 6, verse 6 says this, again, talking about in baptism, knowing this, that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Oh, yeah, that's what we're talking about, right? Yes, that means that you give yourself off, you give up on yourself. When I talk about salvation and invite people to, to accept Jesus, I often will say you need to come to a place where you give up on yourself. And you have nothing left except to fall upon the mercy and the grace of Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.24. Galatians 5.24 says this. Now those who belong to Jesus, Christ Jesus have been crucified with the flesh with its passions and its desires. Now, I don't know about you. I've been a Christian for 36 years now. And there are still some passions and desires that aren't of Jesus in my head and in my heart at times. I have, I have sat before God in frustration and gone like, Lord, I don't understand. Sometimes they've been gone for a while and then they come back. And I'm like, what the heck is that? Like, what is that? Like, how did that happen? Where'd that one come from, right? And I'm frustrated with myself and my growth. And I'm like, wait, I know better. I've been a, I've been, I've been a, you know, when I was a Christian for three years, maybe that's okay or something. But I've been a Christian for 36 years now. Come on, Patrick. What's going on there? And yet, and yet, it's about crucifying myself to my self every day. Dying 
to me so that I might truly live for Jesus. Why? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says that we are not our own, that we have been bought with a price. I'm not my own anymore. I want to be my own. If I'm honest, I still, you know, I still, I'm like, all right, I, again, I've, I've been a pastor long enough. I've been a Christian long enough to be like, yeah, yeah, I got it, God. I'm, I'm, I'm all good. I know I need to give it over to you. I know I need to trust you. And then something happens, and then I try to figure it out on my own, and I try to do it, and I try to push it, and I try to manipulate the situation to make it happen the way we want it to happen. We do all kinds of gyrations to make something go the way we think it should go until finally we go, all right, Jesus, I give up. Like, I'm, I don't understand. We get frustrated at God sometimes. I'm doing everything I can, God. How come it's not working? And God would say, well, maybe it will if you get out the way and leave some room for the Holy Spirit. Listen, the death process toward the old self is often ugly. It's often ugly. Because we're trying to make it into what we want it to be. And what God wants is unconditional surrender. Right? We're to command it to freely give, our, give ourselves at the cross. Romans 12.1. I urge you, brethren, at the mercies of God to offer your bodies a living sacrifice. See, our problem is we crawl on, we crawl off. We crawl on, we crawl off. We crawl on, we crawl off. What do you want me to do, God? You know... Well, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Just tell me first. If you need to hear it first, it's because you want to be able to say yes or no. Death needs to die. What do you, what needs to die in your life to Jesus? What needs to die? What are you grabbing hold of and that you have all control over and that you think that you're going to, I can't give this up? I mean, even, even for, you know, one of the challenges for our mops group will be, Jack is cute, man. That kid is adorable. But ultimately, he's not the Bex. He's God's. Matter of fact, uh, we, we did that together up here a month and a half ago where we gave Jack to the Lord. We dedicated Jack unto Jesus. In fact, that's when he became my buddy because he just snuggled right in. I loved him. I'm like, dude, I need to hold him more. Um, but, right, we, we've done that. But do we really do that? Or do we say, you know, God, you, you can have my kid, but you can only have my kid to hear. What, what needs to die? Um, trust me, I'm not telling you. I mean, Abraham had to lay his son on the altar. And, and you do too. Please, not the physical altar. <laughs> but, um, but we need to give it all over to Jesus. Our hopes, our dreams, everything. The last thing that we need, if we're going to unconditionally surrender to Jesus, is determination. I don't know if this is the best word, but it starts with a D, and I wanted them all to start with a D, uh, honestly. So, but look at what he says. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, why do I say determination? Why do I say, like, that, that's, a, that's a thing of, okay, I got I to gotta take up my cross, but then, but then I got to go. Then I got to actually put one foot in front of the other, symbolically sometimes, but I got to put one foot in front of the other, and I got to follow Jesus. I got to do what Jesus called me to do. I got to go where Jesus called me to go. I got to give what Jesus called me to give. I got to do whatever Jesus tells me. I got to do it. And, 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 and that means, and maybe it should be discipline. I don't even know. I don't know what that word should be. Good D word, whatever you, let me know later. We'll put in somewhere else. But, um, right, it's, we need to keep going. God's not looking for starters. He's wanting finishers. The fact that you ran the first hundred yards in a race and you were the first one out front doesn't mean you win. How many people sprint out, you know, and, and we've, been, we, we've told this a lot, right? Christian life is not a, a sprint, it's a marathon. Right? I've been a Christian for 36 years. I'm tired of 36-year-old Christians, and I don't, I'm not saying I'm 36. 
I've just been in Christ 36, right? So I'm tired of people who've been in Christ 36 years who, are, who have dropped off the face of everything. Well, you were a lightning bolt when you first started. That's awesome. Where are you at now? Let's serve Jesus. Let's walk in Jesus. Let's follow Jesus every day, every step. When I'm tired, let's go. I got to tell you, so life groups are coming up. I have many times, many times in my history before a pastor or whatever gone, oh, I got to go to life group or Bible study or whatever you call that at the time. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I'm tired. I got a lot going on. I don't have time for this. And then I go because I'm obligated or because I'm leading it, <laughs> you know, whatever. You know, whatever you're doing, right? You got to go. But you go and you go, man, I'm so glad I went. God refreshed me. God used me. God used somebody else for me. See, I got to actually get up out of the chair, get my butt up and get out of the chair and go to the car, start it up and drive to wherever that Bible study is. Wherever that life group is, and then I got to be there. I got to be present in that. <sighs> Desire, denial, death, and determination. That's what it means to unconditionally surrender to Jesus. Not just once, not just, hey, you know, 20 years ago I gave my life to Jesus. Isn't that good enough? No. No. Christian, he wants you now, and he wants you the way he wants you now. And here's the beautiful part. If you choose God and you walk in his way, he will empower you to live that life in Christ. The more you seek God, the more he fills you with his Holy Spirit, the more by the power of the Holy Spirit will you be enabled to do what God has called you to do. Let me tell you something. The reward is out of this world. Literally. Luke chapter 18, verses 28 and 20, and through 30 say this. Peter said, behold, right, this is Peter asking, and I don't know what the, I forget what the situation or, or, or all that's happening, and I don't know what's happening in Peter's heart, but he says, Lord, we've left everything. We've left our own homes to follow you because lots of people have left Jesus at that point. And you know what Jesus said to him? Truly I say to you, there's n there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who will not receive many times as much at this time and in the age to come eternal life. You know, I... Now, he's not talking about device, di divorcing. He's not talking about not caring for your children. He's not, but, but how much do spouses and other family members and, and our kids hold us back from the things of God and from following Jesus because we won't get committed. We just, we want to do everything for them. We want to, I, I mean, and, and listen, this isn't about religion, about coming to church, but how many people miss church on Long Island? Because kids sports on a Sunday morning. How many people won't commit to a Bible study because, well, I got to travel here and do this and do that. You know what you could say to your child? No. Or you can do this, but on this it's sacred. I, I've told my kids. As a matter of fact, I'm, I, I, I'm frustrated. I don't want to say it that way. I, I do get frustrated. So uh, youth is about to kick off a new year. Um, I, I'm frustrated sometimes, parents, that you give your kids a choice to go or not. Why would you give them a choice? Um, matter of fact, sometimes the hindrance is the kid wants to come, but, but, but you're too tired to take them. Like, I, I don't get that. I don't, I don't get how, how we allow all this stuff in life to take us away from pursuing God hard and helping our children and helping our spouse and helping others around us to see Jesus. If our mission really is to exalt Christ and to point others to him, that means everybody. Everyone. But, but I'm tired, but I need this, but I want to do that, but I want to do this. Oh, that's what I was going to tell you. I mean, my kids in my house... Um, 
know this. Um, when, when they're a teenager and they get their first job, you tell them you can work, and we set boundaries, of course, but you can't work Wednesday night because it's youth group, and you can't work Sundays because it's church. Period. And if your boss has a problem with that, tell them to come talk to me. And if they won't hire you, they won't hire you. But those are your hours of availability. I don't care if you work Tuesday night. I don't care. I don't care if you choose to skip that event so that you can work. That's up to you. But you will not work. You can ask any of the kids who have been in my house, all four of them. Um, and as a matter of fact, to the glory of God, there's not a child in my home, even now that they're older, who will tell an employer, who won't tell an employer, I can't work Sunday mornings. I will not work Sundays. Sunday mornings specifically. All right. Desire, denial, death, determination. Are you a believer? So it starts with being a believer. And I, and I get it because you have to give up something even to believe, right? You have to give up on you. And maybe there's somebody today who needs, who God's going, hello, can you give up on you now? Because you're not going to earn your way to heaven. You're not going to get there. It's only through me. It's only by my grace. But even after salvation, guess what? He's telling us, hey, time to give up on you. And maybe there's some today who need to, before Jesus, give something over to him. He's calling us to do that. Unconditional surrender. That's what he wants. Let me pray. Father God, I love you. I thank you for grace. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for your death for us. I thank you for the life that we now have in you. I thank you um, that you choose to use us. I thank you that you still love us even after we've failed you so many times. Father, Lord, may we, may we give up on us. May we give up on, on all those things. And Lord, the reality is if we will put everything on the altar, the, the reality is, is that you will give some things back and say, okay, you can now do that. And some things you won't give back. Lord, we need to be willing to die to everything. We need to be willing to die. May we do that today. Unconditionally surrender to you and to your grace. I love you, Lord. And I thank you and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.